We here at Bowling World hope to teach you, test you, and tell you just what's happening from week to week in our great game. It's also our intent to cover everything from juniors to seniors, as well as both of the pro tours, and report on various amateur competitions. There will also be a number of features, interviews, trips back into history, and helpful tips to improve your game. Bowling World offers all of us a unique vehicle to promote, educate, and inform bowlers and non-bowlers alike about our universal sport. From time to time throughout the next three months, we'll be asking you, the bowling fan, for your input in regard to a number of pertinent questions and elections. Your queries and concerns are always welcome, and we'll do our very best to satisfy them. I'm looking forward to being your host. So stay with us as we expand our knowledge in covering and uncovering that vast territory known as the bowling world. We'll be right back. Breaking bowling records is an important part of Mike Albee's business. But the man who earned more money in 1989 than any pro in history, some $300,000, he takes it all in stride. And his motto is simple, just keep trying to improve. Mike Albee has no immediate plans of opening his own bank. But first Albee of Indianapolis? Mmm, does have a nice ring to it. Earlier in the year, Albee topped the single season earnings mark of 225,000 set by Brian Voss. With victories like the U.S. Open, where he came from 24th place, the ABC Bud Light Masters, and three other titles, Albee is on the road to becoming 89th Boulder of the Year. Surprisingly, at this time last year, he was considering giving up the tour. That's when he took three months of R&R. &R. The Indiana native hadn't scored big since 85, and in his words, bowling had become a grind. Then I took a lot of time off last year and uh, almost three months and uh, got my head back together. My desire came back and, and that's the big difference this year. Uh, when I won, I was ready to win again the next week when I went to bowl. During his sabbatical from the tour, Albee did what he usually does when at home in Indianapolis. He looked up his friends at the Royal Pin Leisure Centers. Ron Adkins and owner-operator Don Mitchell know Albee's game as well as anyone. Coaching the champ is rarely necessary, but they did help Albee out of his slump. Mitchell was the first person to sponsor Albee on the pro tour, and to show his appreciation, Albee spends a lot of time with the younger bowlers in Indianapolis. He's a hero around all the kids, so that helps us, but uh, just being involved with Mike in general, is just he's just such a fine young man, that, uh, and everybody thinks it isn't just us. And we just couldn't have found a better representative under any circumstances. Every Saturday that I'm home, I'll go through to the centers, and uh, I'll usually bowl one frame on each lane. They'll bowl against my scores, and then I'll hang around and talk to the kids and uh, sign autographs and uh, just be there for them. I just got this new bowling ball. It's a little bit harder to release it because it's just a little bit heavier. Okay. Well, we'll watch you throw a few. and then For we'll Mike Albee, making working friends working and making bit. money both come easy. But Albee says making a name for himself is more important than the money. You've got to have the money, obviously, to survive. This is my only job, and this is where I make my living. So. Uh, but to me, the fun is getting a trophy on Saturday, and uh, that's what it's all about, recognition. And long after the money's gone, those trophies are still going to be up there in my room. Everybody knows you can tell a lot about a person by how they live. Here at the Albee residence in Indianapolis, it's not the trophy room that's getting all the attention these days. It's the nursery. We were very excited to find out that Tammy was pregnant, and of course now we're going through the baby classes and all, and uh, each day is a different different thing with the baby, or you know the baby moves, or this or that, so it's, it's very exciting for us, and uh, we look forward to it to a long time, and it's one of those things where until it happens, you wonder if you're going to be fortunate enough for that, that event to happen, and uh, we're really looking forward to it. Oh, he's a pretty good student. Now, he's attended everything. He's been with me from every doctor's appointment, everything. He's attended everything, so he wouldn't miss the classes either. But uh, he's pretty good. He's, uh, he was yelling at me last night because I wasn't breathing correctly, but he's uh, pretty avid. <laughs> Mike and Tammy can't wait to bring the baby on tour. Their little bumper bowler will have three babysitters in the family, the daughters of Candy and Steve Cook. Tammy and Candy are sisters, so that makes Mike and Steve brothers-in-law. Earlier this year, the two pro bowlers teamed up to win the PBA doubles. Just one big family. It's nice to have your family out there with you, especially when you're away from home so often. At home or on the road, all these hobbies take his mind off bowling. He attends every hockey game he can, especially if it's the Islanders, shoots action photos at the games, and collects baseball cards. And what other pro bowler do you know who's a commissioner of baseball? 
rotisserie baseball, that is. So the next time you want to start a conversation with this pro bowler, you could try, how about them Islanders? But with Mike Albee, the guaranteed approach is to just say hello. For Bowling World, this is Jim Micah reporting from Indianapolis. With the 90s rapidly approaching, one question in the bowling world is, who will be the bowler of the 80s? Bowling World, through your input, will select the top male and female bowlers of the 80s. Each week, we'll spotlight a star, giving you the background of the candidate and his or her achievements. On December 12th and the 18th, the 11th and the 12th weeks of Bowling World, you'll have the opportunity to call a 900 number to select the bowler that you think was the best of the decade. You will make the call, and we'll announce the winners on the final show, which airs December 26th. This week, we feature the great one, Earl Anthony. Now we watch Anthony on his first ball of the 10th frame. He's already wrapped up this victory. And he did. Holds on. Although he retired from full-time competition in 1984, Earl Anthony is still a solid contender for Bowling World's Player of the 1980s. In addition to his 12 titles, he had 11 second-place finishes. He carried the PBA's high average in both 1980 and 83 with marks of 218 and 216. Anthony became Bowling's first millionaire in 1982 and was selected as the Player of the Year in 81, 82, and 83. The smooth-stroking lefty is best known for his amazing ability to adjust to lane conditions, his confidence, and his clutch shooting. His competitive nature burned brightest when he won the 1984 ABC Masters crown, despite retiring the previous year. Anthony competes on the PBA Senior Tour when his schedule permits, and he won the 1988 PBA Seniors Championship. Don't forget, you'll have an opportunity to vote for the bowler of the 80s. And coming up next on Bowling World, an interview with Team USA coordinator Fred Borden. Long a respected coach of the top professionals, our guest personality this week, Fred Borden, is now centering much of his activity on making Team USA, America's bowling squad, the best in the world, and also improving the talent and the scope of junior bowling across the entire country. And welcome, Fred, to Bowling World. Hi, Denny. Most people don't realize that uh, Fred Borden, for well, I guess the better part of 30 years, has been teaching bowling on all the different levels. And uh, how did you ever get involved originally? Well, Denny, you know, I started in 1962 doing. Uh Daytime housewife learned to bowl classes in Akron, Ohio for first class, as a matter of fact, was 92 ladies. And I was the only instructor, jumping over ball returns, going back and <laughs> forth. And you, soon, you soon learn how to teach the game. Yeah, you don't have really have much choice. As a matter of fact, we've gone back in our archives and we've retrieved some videotape of one of those ladies that, that you started working with at Colonial Lanes. Uh, basically located in Akron, Ohio, and uh, through the wonders of modern technology. We're going to take a look at this young lady right now. And it looks at this point, Fred, as if you really had to work on that thumping over the thumb hole, didn't you? You know, the first thing we did, uh, the thing I learned from Billy Hardwick years ago was we plugged the thumb hole and moved it over. <laughs> <laughs> Hardwick would be able to tell that story. And, of course, uh, choosing the proper equipment, always a key in bowling. And, uh, oh, my, she had a little problem there. <laughs> Everything's bouncing and they're having some fun as well. Boy, I hope we get a good <laughs> shot of you and, of course, the proper stance and technique. Heading to the line and uh, lights are out for that lady right there. Kind of hard to believe, Borge, but uh, really you didn't have a lot to work with there. Well, uh, Denny, you know when you, when you have uh, 92 ladies, you find something to work with, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Boy, one of the great players of all time, Don Johnson, has credited you with, by and large, his success as a professional. 26 wins, PBA Hall of Fame. Uh, what was Coco like to work with? Benny was a true treat. You know, he was uh, not afraid to try anything. You know, if we wanted to put him on roller skates and push him up there, he'd try that to throw a strike. Uh, it was a back and forth situation. It was a real good communication between Coco and I. And uh, we developed not only uh, uh, the bowling uh, uh, time out on the lanes, but a friendship. And, and I think that showed through because we really attacked the game. Uh, we really were a team to, to, to win the titles, and it was really a, a fun time in our life. 
And of course, more recently, you've had an opportunity to work with Mark Williams. He already has won the Firestone twice. And some of the other lady professionals, Donna Adamek and you work together. So uh, you're branching out a little bit. And when we speak of that, you're now uh, the Team USA coordinator, a whole different uh, environment for you now. And, and, and you get a chance to take some young minds and young bodies and try and mold them once again. Well, Denny, it's, it's fun to work with some of the best amateurs in the world. And the talent out there is just tremendous. Uh, these people, uh, and they already know a lot about the game. They, they grew up in the YABA junior programs, a lot of them. Uh, they've got some good junior bowling coaches. And, and if we can add just a little to their uh, background of, of bowling, that uh, probably the biggest thing that we work with them is on playing different lane conditions. Uh, they grew up at home playing on a condition they get very used to. In international competition, they're traveling all over the world, bowling on a lot of different conditions. and. Uh, Working on different conditions is, is really something that we spend a lot of time with, and that's really the fun part. And, and I know you're very excited, uh, quickly, about the sport itself. It's time to get pumped up a little bit, get positive about the sport of bowling. Yeah, Denny, you know, bowling is, is such a great sport. It's, uh, it's so good for families to get out and bowl together. You know, they talk about golf being a great game, and I think it is a great game. But I've never seen a seventh them on the golf course. But yet in our centers, I've seen where there's been a grandmother and a grandfather and, 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 and a mother and a father and three children. And they're down there bowling, and it's such a great game from a social standpoint. It's a, it's a great game for, for interaction on team play, and, and uh, it's just a great game uh, through and through. And, of course, for the next 12 weeks, Fred will be hosting, as I mentioned, Bowling for the Gold, and we're covering everything from stance to ball position uh, to just about everything you could think of. Well, you know, uh, Denny, we're really going to try to give uh, people an insight on some things that we've worked with some of the very best players in the world on and uh, some of the things that, that not things that I came up with but things from Johnny Petraglia, from Earl Anthony, from Don Johnson, from George Pappas, from a lot of the best players in the world, some of their ideas. Of course we want to mention the fact that we'll be utilizing both Mike Albee and Lee Isla Wagner during that series and Fred thanks for stopping by and I, I know that, uh, that we're going to enjoy our association here in the next 13 weeks on Bowling World. It's going to be fun Denny. Another of our weekly features on Bowling World will be ABC Hall of Famer Earl Anthony with his time capsules, looking back at the history of our sport. Most bowlers find it a difficult task just trying to keep the ball on the lane and somewhere near the pocket. However, our legendary bowlers go far beyond that level as they show us what can be done if you practice, practice, practice. Trick shots, that is. When Andy Verapapa talked about his trick shots, he drew himself up and stated emphatically, they are not trick shots. They're highly skilled precision shots developed by manipulation. Well, whatever they were, they've entertained millions for many, many decades. In the early days of exhibition bowling, top stars were sent out to display their skills to help promote the game. They soon discovered an added attraction, the so-called trick shots. Andy Verapapa was the master of the trick shot. He elevated it to an art form with a show business flair. But even before Vera Papa, there were bowlers such as fellow Hall of Famer Joe Falcaro who developed some amazing shots that thrilled spectators, most of whom had a problem just keeping the ball on the lane. Though they made it look easy, it took countless hours to perfect the shots. Through the years, many of the same shots with modern variances have been used. As you look at some of these great trick shot shooters from the past, right up to those of the modern day, remember, in the early days, most bowlers used two-fingered balls knew little about balance in bowling balls and relied on their skill alone to make the bowling ball do tricks. Of course, in some shots, there was a little behind the scenes help, but I won't reveal how they were done.
I'm Earl Anthony, inviting you to enjoy the history of our sport at the National Bowling Hall of Fame and Museum. And now, let's go around the world of bowling. Sponsored by the Bowling Proprietors Association of America. The Woman Bowler Magazine, official publication of the Women's International Bowling Congress, in conjunction with the Bowling Writers Association of America, has been selecting All-America teams for 16 years. To be named is one of the most coveted honors a woman bowler can achieve. Here's a look at the results of the 1988-89 ballot. Both Lisa Wagner and Robin Romeo posted career years with Lisa topping the $100,000 mark, first time ever on the LPBT tour, and Robin coming close. Consistent Jeannie Maiden captured three titles and finished in the top 24 13 other times. The youngest first team member, Leanne Barrett, at 22, came to the top after only three years of professional bowling, while Cheryl Daniels, a nine-year veteran, has completed the journey into the upper echelon. The success of the Team USA program was borne out by the fact that three amateurs, Patty Ann, Debbie McMullen, and Linda Norrie, were all voted to the second team along with great veteran pros, Alita Sill and Betty Morris. Coming up next, bright lights and highlights. Here's our Bob Dolan. This week's stop on the LPBT was the Hammer Eastern Open at the Country Club Lanes in Baltimore. And in the first match in the championship round, three-time Bowler of the Year, Lisa Wagner used conversions like this to beat Stacy Ryder, 192 to 190. But then Wagner ran into Leanne Barrett, and midway through the match, Barrett hit four in a row, went on to win 227-177. In the semifinals, it was Barrett against Nikki Giannoulias, looking for her 11th career title. Giannoulias broke open a tight match in the ninth. A shot that was close to being a 7-10 ended up being a strike. She won 215-182. So it would be Giannoulias against Alita Sill for the championship. Sill, the number one qualifier, was 16-8 in match play. Average 222, but she fell behind early in this match when Giannoulias opened with three in a row. Sill was behind most of the match, but her finishing kick was a strong one. This strike in the 10th gave her the lead. Then in the 11th, she hit another one. Come on, Bob. Oh, a clutch shot for Alita Sill, who strikes in the 11th. Sill finished the match with another strike, her third in a row, posted a 217. Giannoulias had to get two strikes and two pins to win the match. But on her first ball, she slipped and fouled. Sill won the match, her 16th career victory. It was worth $7,000. Meanwhile, recently in Milwaukee, the 1989 Team USA National Finals were held. Women's semifinals, Maureen Webb of Massachusetts finished with three in a row, scored a 183. But still, it was not enough to beat Linda Graham of Des Moines. Graham at one time hit five out of six on her way to a 226. And thus on her way to the championship against Kathy Almeida of New Jersey. She was the number one qualifier. She rolled a 192 in this championship match. Graham needed to mark in the 10th to win, needed to convert the 3610. She did, tagged on a strike at the end and won 201 to 191 to become the national amateur champion. For the men, semifinal match between Adam Apo of Hawaii and Mark Skyer of Colorado. Key shot of the match, Skyer leaves the four pin, picked up the spare in the 12th, but finished at 229. That four pin was the difference because Apo had already posted a 234. So it would be Apo against Tony Stipkak Jr. of Canton, Michigan in the final. Eighth frame, Stipkak cannot convert the 6-7, giving Apo the lead. Opposed strikes on the 10th, wrapped it up with a spare, wins the match 194-177 to win the men's amateur championship and become the first Hawaiian ever to make Team USA. Apo and Graham head up a team of 12, the 1990 Team USA, which will represent the country in international competition next year. With bright lights and highlights, this is Bob Dolan for Bowling World.
the comeback trail of Rick Steelsmith, and Tom Jordan's near-perfect performance. That's it for this issue of Bowling World. Why not go out to your local bowling center and bowl a few games this week? Enjoy the world of bowling. So long, everyone. <laughs>